Hello, I'm Bria Castle, a sophomore biology major at Oglethorpe University, and today I'm going to be talking about how predators, specifically birds, affect their ecosystems. I chose this topic with a background because I have a background in animal behavior and an interest in ecology. So I'm going to start with an outline of my talk today. So I'm going to be starting with background, giving some definitions and important vocabulary. Um, then I'll go on to tell you what ecologists already know. Then I'll go into the experiment that I chose to focus on today by going over the introduction, then the methods, then the results, then the conclusion. Then I'll give some take home messages and at the end, I'll have my references. So starting with the background and the definitions, um, a trophy cascade is the indirect interactions between trophic levels, which would be predators, prey, primary producers, and how they affect each other. Then arthropods are invertebrate animals having an exoskeleton. An example of these would be insects. Um, refuge habitat, which is a habitat that predators cannot get to, which is usually the breeding ground of their prey. Um, terrestrial systems, which are any ecosystems on land. And then indeterminacy which is um, something that is unknown. And the reason that I included this word here is because there's an indeterminacy with predators and how they interact with their ecosystems, which is the whole reason that ecologists are still studying this and trying to find out more about it. Okay. Sorry, my picture covers it up. There's nothing I could really do about that. But now on to what's already known. So we'll start with trophic levels, which I mentioned a little bit before when giving the definition of trophic cascade. So trophic levels are um, the levels of the food web. And um, now I'll go into the old model versus the new model. So the old model is a three level has three trophic levels, which would be the predator, prey, primary producer, which this model does work for most ecosystems, but not all of them, which is why a new model was introduced, where there is a predator above the predators, which you can see in this picture that I included here. Um, what they call these um, predators is hierarchical. They call it a higher order predation, which is when you have a predator that preys on another predator. And then there's the optimal foraging theory, which states that natural selection, um, natural selection um, wants um, or likes it when a animal will take less energy um, in time when foraging for its food. And there are two different types of foraging. There's the sit and wait foraging, which is when a predator will sit and wait um, for its prey to come along and then attack when the prey is right there in front of them. And then there's active foraging, which is when the predator will actively hunt for its food. Both of these foraging techniques have their pros and cons when it comes to the optimal foraging theory because sit and wait, while well, yes, there is an, in, a, a decrease in movement, which means they save energy there, there is an increase in time. And then for active foraging, there is an increase in energy use for movement, but a decrease in time. Um, then I'm going to go, there's the bottom up versus top down control. Bottom up control is when 
um, this is when um, the producers have an influence on the trophic levels above them, while top-down control is when the absence or presence of the predator um, affects the trophic levels below it. Okay, what's already known continued. There are traits mediated indirect interactions. And what these are is um, when a predator will indirectly change the behavior of its prey. And usually what this entails is when the prey will switch its own prey um, or it will go into starvation. It can even lead to prey emigrating away from its predator. And then there are density mediated indirect interactions. And this is when a predator will indirectly affect its, its producer when directly interacting with its prey. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later on in this presentation. Then there's Tim Bergen, who was a famous Dutch biologist who came up with four questions in, in, um, when dealing with animal behavior and um, trying to put it, animal behavior into different categories of why and how and all of that. Why and how an animal will have a certain behavior. Um, two main types that I'm going to mention today is proximate and ultimate, which proximate is um, the answer of how the animal uh, gains this behavior, while ultimate is the evolutionary side behind why the animal has this behavior. And I do have an example of this, um, of Tim Bergen's questions being used in a study of um, on birds, actually, where um, the ecologist who ran that study came up with approximate reason of why um, a predator will prey on another predator. And the answer to that was to eliminate the competition because they all have, they both have the same prey. And then lastly, there's plant biomass which plant biomass is the measurement of um, the mass of a plant, both above and below ground. And this is important when dealing with density mediated interact interactions, because um, this is how you can tell if a plant or primary producer was affected by a predator-prey interaction. Now on to the study that I will be focusing on today, which is called Do Birds Help Trees Grow? An experimental study of the effects of land use intensification on avian trophic cascades. So this study came about with the knowledge of trophic cascades, but they had the question of how strong are these cascades? Um, so bottom up and top down, and uh, controls, which I talked about before, it was their baseline of doing like running the study because both of those controls affect trophic cascades and their strengths. So they came up with two hypotheses to test this. They came up with the ecosystem elimination hypothesis, which was a bottom up. Uh, um, bottom up um, to figure out if bottom up controls work um, by um, either, uh, basically eliminating um, the primary producer. And they also came up with the green earth uh, hypothesis, which stated that it was the predator that affected the amount of herbivores. And this was their top-down 
um, hypothesis. They also noted that in many experiments that tried to test this before, um, the results were a bit inconclusive because they didn't spend enough time doing the running the experiment. So when they came up with um, how they were going to do their experiment, they first decided that they would um, con control both plant vegetation and the amount of birds present, which the birds are the predators. And they ran this study for four years to make sure that they got accurate results. Now on to the methods. Um, for their area of study, they chose um, a temperate forest that they then planted um, some nursery stock Douglas firs and then split the land into seven different plots. And on these plots, um, they, and they would uh, randomly decide um, if how um, uh, the use of herbicides and the elimination of birds. So as you can see here in these two pictures that I have, A is one of the plots with no herbicides and B is one of the plots with herbicides intense. And the reason I said intense is because there were three levels of herbicides that they used. They had intense, immediate, and light. And then they also had a plot with control, which was one that had no herbicides present. And um, also with the plots that did not have birds present, as you can see, the blue mesh, they put a mesh over the whole thing to make sure that no birds could get in so that they could make sure that, that uh, the top down was um, calculated or found properly. Um, to determine um, the arthropods that were present in each plot, which the arthropods are the herbivores for this experiment, they did a sweep of each plot where they would um, walk the area of the plot with a little net uh, against the floor of the plot and collect the arthropods that were present. They would then identify and count how many were there and put them back. Um, as for birds, they would um, listen out for them and watch for them to determine how many birds were present and what all bird species were there. For the results, when it came to the bottom up, which is, came to the herbicide level, um, there was a decrease in total plant cover as herbicide level went up. There was a decrease in plant species richness as herbicide level went up, and there was an increase in wood volume change when the herbicide level went up, which wood volume is the amount of wood present in the plant. Okay, this is results continue. And this graph shows that, um, uh, that as total plant cover went up, there was an increase in bird abundance. And then it also shows the different herbicide levels, which intensive herbicide levels, of course, there is less plant cover, meaning less birds uh, present, and then control which had the most plant cover and the most bird abundance. But even though there was more birds around with a more plant cover, this did not affect the top-down control because the amount of bird predation on the arthropods did not change. Okay, so in conclusion, 
um, the herbicides did not change the predator-prey relationship between the birds and the arthropods, and the birds did not increase vegetation, but they did reduce plant damage by preying on the arthropods, which is a good thing. And they didn't get the results that they wanted, but they were still glad that this is now a known fact that birds reduce plant damage. Okay, so my take home messages are that predators play a huge role in their ecosystems. And because um, if a predator is not around, then there will be less primary producers or plants because the herbivores will, there will be too many herbivores. Um, there will be a bigger her herbivore to plant ratio. Um, the second one is birds do indirectly help the growth of trees. Even though I stated that, um, and it was found out that birds do not um, increase the vegetation, but they do help with um, plant species richness or the cover because um, less arthropods will be eating the leaves. Um, and then the last one is that understanding trophic cascades helps us to connect animal behavior to ecology. Um, I say this because throughout all of these studies that I have read and researched for this presentation, um, animal behavior was present as along with the ecology in all of the studies. And then I have my references. So thank you for watching.